Clinical psychology is the study of psychological disorder, which is often defined as, quote, deviant, distressful, and dysfunctional behavior patterns. Note that this definition focuses on the observable, on behavior patterns that can be witnessed. However, if psychological disorder exists, then what does it mean to be psychologically healthy or ordered? Do we even know? Psychologist Carol Riff, who researches well-being and aging, argues that mental health must be defined in terms of positive attributes. Riff identifies six core dimensions of well-being, and she believes that mentally healthy people exhibit most of these dimensions at once. A psychologically healthy person is self-accepting. That is, they not only have a positive attitude toward themselves, but they acknowledge and accept multiple aspects of themselves, including both good and bad qualities. A person who exhibits self-acceptance generally feels positive about their past life and decisions. Psychologically healthy persons also maintain positive relations with other people. They are able to form and maintain warm, satisfying, and trusting interpersonal relationships. The maintenance of these relationships is possible because mentally healthy people are capable of empathy, affection, and intimacy, and they are concerned about the welfare of others. Psychologically healthy people have autonomy. They are independent, self-determining, and self-controlled. They are able to resist social pressures to think and act in specific ways, and they prefer to make up their own minds about what behavior is appropriate in any given situation. The mentally healthy have a sense of environmental mastery. They are competent in managing their environment, and they know how to make good use of available opportunities. They are able to choose or create contexts that are supportive of their personal needs or values. This idea connects somewhat with the concept of internal locus of control. Mentally healthy people believe that they can create positive outcomes, that they can make the best out of even bad situations. Psychologically healthy people feel that they have a purpose in life. They have both goals and a sense of directedness. The mentally healthy tend to feel that there is a meaning to life and they hold beliefs that give their life purpose. The sense of purpose isn't necessarily tied to religious belief, but it can be. Purpose can also be the result of strong moral or ethical beliefs and can influence a person's choice of occupation or vocation. Finally, mentally healthy people experience regular personal growth. Healthy people see themselves as continually growing and expanding. They're open to new experiences and have a sense of realizing their potential. They change in ways that reflect improved self-knowledge and effectiveness. Riff believes that people living with psychological disorder are missing some, or maybe even pieces of all, of these core dimensions in their lives. The difficult part about understanding and diagnosing some psychological disorders is that a person may outwardly exhibit all six of these core dimensions, but they may be only pretending. They may not actually feel connections to others, or that they have control over their lives, or that they believe their life has a purpose. So, when diagnosing mental illness, digging deeper is key. The ways in which medical professionals and society in general have defined, discussed, and addressed mental health has changed over time in significant ways. Besides individuals who were obviously neuroatypical, such as people who were born with Down syndrome or other disorders involving developmental delays, just about anyone who strayed from social norms might be labeled psychologically disordered, or depending on the time period, a psychologically disordered person might have been labeled as possessed. For instance, women who challenged social norms but ultimately were able to live within society might be called high-strung, but those women who exhibited behaviors described historically as melancholia or disinterest in motherhood or excessive weeping might be diagnosed as having hysteria, a diagnosis reserved for women. Even as hysteria is no longer a single diagnosis only applied to women, the definition of normal or mentally healthy has itself been viewed differently in men and women. In the 1970s, Inga Broverman and her associates found that sex-based bias existed in the diagnosis of mental disorder. This bias existed regardless of the sex or gender of the mental health professional. Healthy men were more likely to be viewed as exhibiting ambitious, adventurous, self-confident, logical, and independent behavior. Psychologically healthy women were shown as exhibiting tactful, awareness of others' feelings, gentleness, expressiveness, and the need of security in their behaviors. 
These are all attributes closely tied to women's historical gender roles. So, a woman who exhibited adventurous behavior might be considered on the borderline of psychological disorder for no other reason than that she was a woman exhibiting this behavior. Interestingly, what Broverman's research also found was that despite reporting differences in how they approached diagnosis, mental health professionals tended to treat both men and women similarly, indicating that clinicians may disregard sexual stereotypes when actually developing treatment plans for a particular individual. Nonetheless, various kinds of bias, sex-based, race-based, size-based, among others, persist in medical and mental health diagnoses. It should also be noted that bias has affected psychological and medical research, not just diagnosis. Much of the information which forms the body of psychological understanding has been focused on the Western world, meaning that there is a strong cultural bias both in determining what behaviors might be considered disordered and in choosing what disordered behaviors to research. Indeed, as psychological research has slowly become more inclusive, it is increasingly clear that some disorders are culture-bound. They appear only in certain areas of the world and appear to be truly fostered by a person's culture. At the same time, these disorders exhibit real and treatable symptoms, regardless of where you are in the world. In the West, Individuals are diagnosed with eating disorders like anorexia nervosa and bulimia, which seem tied to social expectations regarding body shape and size. In Latin American countries, it is common to hear of susto, a disorder marked by severe anxiety, restlessness, and a fear of black magic. Susto is tied to traditional indigenous beliefs in black magic or the evil eye, a belief that frightening strangers or contact with frightful supernatural beings might impact an individual negatively. Susto is most often diagnosed in infants and young children, although older individuals are sometimes also diagnosed. Besides the severe anxiety and restlessness, susto is also marked by depression, loss of weight, weakness, and a rapid heartbeat. The treatment of susto nearly always utilizes traditional folk remedies because many psychological treatises don't include susto as a diagnosis. But depending on one's location and cultural background, one might be treated for susto by having certain plants rubbed along the skin or burnt nearby while chanting spells or prayers. For many Latinos with a Catholic background, a diagnosis of susto might be treated with rubbing a raw egg over a patient's skin three times while whispering a variety of prayers, often including the Apostles' Creed. After the third time, the egg is cracked in a bowl or glass filled with cold water. If the egg appears to cook in the cold water, then the patient has been cured of susto. If the egg does not cook, then the diagnosis of susto was incorrect, and it's time to figure out the right diagnosis. Another culture-bound disorder is amok, originally found in the Indian Ocean Basin and, thanks largely to the African diaspora after the 16th century, also in Latin America. Occurring more often in men than in women, the afflicted jump around violently, yell loudly, and attack objects and other people. The exhibition of these symptoms is often preceded by social withdrawal and a loss of contact with reality, and followed by depression, then amnesia regarding the symptomatic behavior. Within these cultures, it is believed that stress, shortage of sleep, alcohol consumption, and extreme heat are the primary causes. Treating these primary causes leads to successful recovery from amok. Since the 1950s, the classification of mental disorders has been organized into the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or the DSM. This manual is edited every few years. The newest edition is the DSM-5. The first DSM was published in 1952 as a way to synthesize and codify a variety of psychological research papers regarding disorders, particularly those studied during the global war period at the beginning of the 20th century that is, disorders affecting veterans of the wars. From that first printing and through its various editions, the DSM has consistently been critiqued based on its classification system and methodology. Psychologists have long criticized the cultural bias of the DSM. For example, Susto and Amok are not listed. And some also criticize the fact that the DSM is focused on the identification of the disorder looking at its symptoms, and not the underlying causes of or treatments for the disorder. Additionally, some argue that the classification system, based on five axes, 
also arbitrarily divides disorders into groups and equally arbitrarily determines normal and abnormal behavior. It has also been argued that the inclusion of and removal of some disorders stems primarily from political considerations or medical and pharmacological considerations, and not true psychology. For example, homosexuality was listed as a medical disorder until the 1970s when it was removed from the DSM. Did this removal reflect hard scientific findings that homosexuality was biologically based, or did it, as some psychologists alleged, reflect changing political norms? The most recent debate regarding the DSM-5 is the decision to remove specific autistic disorders such as Asperger's from the DSM and to instead classify all people with autism under a single diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. Despite all of these valid criticisms, the DSM remains the basic manual for psychological diagnosis. It organizes diagnoses into five dimensions called axes that relate to different aspects of the disorder or disability. It is possible for a person to be diagnosed in multiple dimensions. Axis 1 includes all diagnostic categories except intellectual disability and personality disorders. This axis includes all of the anxiety disorders and mood disorders, as well as the various attention deficit disorders and autism spectrum disorder. The vast majority of people living with a mental health diagnosis are diagnosed with an axis 1 disorder. Axis 2 includes disorders that involve intellectual disabilities, as well as various personality disorders, such as schizophrenia. Axis 3 includes general and acute medical conditions, such as TBI or traumatic brain injury, as well as physical disorders. Often, an Axis 3 diagnosis may be a foundational cause of an Axis 1 or Axis 2 diagnosis. For instance, someone who experiences a severe TBI or a series of TBIs may also experience depression or anxiety as they work toward total or partial recovery. Axis 4 includes the psychosocial and environmental factors which contribute to the Axis 1, 2, or 3 diagnosis. Axis 5 includes the accepted diagnostic tests of mental health. Individuals over 18 are generally diagnosed based on the Global Assessment Scale of Functioning, and those under 18 are diagnosed using the Children's Global Assessment Scale. Both assessments use a numeric scale from 0 to 100, which is used to rate an individual's social, occupational, and psychological functioning, or how well adapted one is to deal with the problems of living. Generally speaking, mentally healthy adults score between 81 and 100. Those scoring between 61 to 80 exhibit either minor symptoms that may be related to a specific current psychosocial or environmental situation, or exhibit good coping mechanisms for their symptoms that allow them to live life normally. Those scoring between 51 and 60 exhibit moderate symptoms, while those scoring 50 and below are more seriously ill, with individuals scoring between 1 and 10 exhibiting a persistent danger to themselves or to others. As we move through this unit on clinical psychology, we'll continue to explore various diagnoses from axes 1, 2, and 3.